Welcome to God of Glory, King Savano Ministries. My name is Rod James. Appreciate you joining us today. We're going to be looking today at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And I want to speak to you today about the God of law and order. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will you then not be afraid of the authority do that which is good and you shall have praise of the same for he is the minister of God to you for good but if you do that which is evil be afraid for he bears not the sword in vain for he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience sake for for this cause pay you taxes also for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due custom to whom custom fear to whom fear and honor to whom honor The God of law and order. And in the next several weeks, we will look at how God regulates for us law and order. We will look at moral law, civil law, ceremonial law, medical law, church and family law, and the law of due. As we just read in verse 7, render to all their due. People try to undermine the Bible. Today, today I'm going to merely give you an overview, an introduction to what we're going to speak about the next several weeks. When I began doing this, I thought it was going to be one message. And the more and more and more notes I wrote down and scripture passages I wrote down, I could see it was going to be a series. Um, we've done series on Calvinism before. We've done series on uh, the law is holy and righteous and good. We've done several series. Th this one's important because people try to undermine the Bible by conflating things that are separate issues. And because they simply don't understand what's being discussed. In some cases, moral and civil law overlap. Like the death penalty, or you're not allowed to steal things. The civil is when the police come and arrest you. The moral is when God will judge you about it. Sometimes those things overlap. Sometimes they have nothing to do with each other. To Israel... They overlapped completely because God gave them both. It depends on your civilization what civil law is followed. Ceremonial law in the Bible always prefigures Christ. It was always pointing to something about his life, something about him, something about what he was going to do for us in his life, death, and resurrection. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 to 28, says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. He's talking about 
how they did Old Testament sacrifices of animals and the different things they used in that sacrifice and the different things that were in the temple. He said those things are just a pattern of the heavenly. They all pointed towards Jesus Christ. They all pointed towards the cross of Christ, all the sacrifices. They were just a pattern of the things. But the things that are actually regarded in heaven were better sacrifices than those. He says the cross of Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands. He's not entered into the holy of holies that some man built. Which are the figures of the true. It's just a prefigure. It's just a looking ahead to. God was showing them this is what this is like in a shadow. Christ has not entered into into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God the Father for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We see there in verse 23 that it was just a pattern, the, the Old Testament things, the Old Covenant was a pattern of the coming new covenant. And he says, now once, he's defeated sin forever. I want to briefly mention a few things that we're going to look at. As I, I already said, we're going to look at moral, civil, and ceremonial law. We're also going to look at medical law, church and family law, and the law of render to all their due. If each of those are a separate message, that would be six messages, not counting this introductory message. Some of those may be combined together. I'm not sure yet. We'll see. It, there's a lot to it. And it's very important to understand the differences. Moral law transcends culture. It transcends time, and it transcends all limitations. It stands forever. You know, God said, if a man murders a man by man, he shall be put to death. Our culture says we're not going to any longer execute people in most cases. There are some states that still do. Most don't. In other civilizations, you can be killed for something far less. It, it depends on what civilization you're in, what the civil law is. In the Bible, the civil law had to do with Israel. Where moral and civil law overlap, it has to do with all people. Because we are morally responsible to God. But some of the things that addressed were addressed to them was just for Israel in the Old Testament it was their civilization moral law stands forever Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17 we see the Ten Commandments Exodus 20, 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
It, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer was an outline of a prayer. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All those were individual points in a prayer. And while it's appropriate to pray that prayer, he was giving them an outline. He's our Father. There's a lot to talk about there. You know, our Father who art in heaven, it's more than six words. Him being our Father changes the whole situation to Him just being a God. It, it was an outline prayer. They, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. So He was teaching them how to pray. How do you address God? Who do you pray to? You know, why do you think he's going to answer you? Yeah, because he's your father. You don't have to go through a priest or through Mary or pray to some statues or hold some goofy beads in your hands to talk to your father. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy, set apart, different is your name. Your kingdom come. That tells us his kingdom's coming to earth. Your will be done. That tells us his will isn't always being done on earth. Not in the heart of a sinner. Not, not in crime. Not in violence. Uh, not when a sinner dies. That's not his will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That day is coming. It isn't there right now. Or Jesus wouldn't have told them to pray that. It was an outline prayer. This is an outline. It, it is 10 explicit directions of how to conduct yourself, both to God and to mankind. But each point has so many points off of it that it is an outline and you can understand more and more and more about it it's not just that now you shall have no other gods before me and we'll dive into this in much more detail when we do the moral law You shall not make to you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down yourself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the sins of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not, be, will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it... You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested. He ceased from his work on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is your neighbors. The Ten Commandments. I want you to notice one thing 
here in this introduction. Coveting is the only one of the ten that on face value you could do in your mind, according to this. You could do it in your heart. You could do it in secret. The rest of them, people would see. They would know about. If you were worshiping a statue, you know, or if you cursed and took God's name in vain, or if you weren't observing the Sabbath day, or if you didn't honor your father and mother, they would know. And if you murdered someone, if you committed adultery, you know, even if the only people that know is the person you're committing adultery with or the person that you murdered, someone would know. Stealing. Lying. Coveting is the one that is only in your mind and heart. The others are actual physical acts, actual spoken things. But in your mind and in your heart, you could think, I, I wish I had my neighbor's house. You know, I, I wish I had my neighbor's wife. I wish I had whatever. That's, that's a hint of what's to come in the New Testament and really what God intended. As I said, this is an outline, this is a guide, but it is more involved than that. You know, it, it, Jeremiah chapter 31, and verse 33, tells us what God wants. He said, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That's what he wants. He doesn't want it to have to be reminding us on a stone. He wants it to be in us. He wants it to be automatic. He wants it to be as much a part of us as our lungs and our heart. Uh, he, he wants it to be a part of us. Matthew 5, 17 to 28. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He said there's a bigger thing going on here. You know, I didn't come to say, hey, don't worry about all that. I'm here now. He said, all that pointed to me being here now. He said, verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He came to fulfill it. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You've heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. That means vain fellow or fool. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus ratcheted it up. He didn't back away from the law. He said that was the general idea, but this is what it actually meant. Not only shall you not kill, you're not to hate. You're not to talk dishonorably. 
you, you're to completely love that person. Therefore, if you bring a gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has anything against you, leave there your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you shall be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till you have paid the uttermost two cents. You have heard that it was said by them of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. The law said don't commit adultery. Jesus said, you know what, that's right. And don't even look. And don't even think about it. That that's, he took it another step. He didn't cross out the law. He further enhanced the law. The God of law and order. We're almost done with the introduction. The civil law. And the word of God was for Israel and their culture from God. You know, we have American law in our culture. It's from God and man. It's mixed. Some of our laws are from the Word of God, and some of them have been changed to accommodate man. We are to follow civil law unless it contradicts God's moral law. Then we follow God. If there's a divide, if there's a split there someplace where you have to make a choice, you follow the moral law. Ceremonial law is not relevant because it was completed in Christ. It's an outward witness. All those things, the ceremonies, all, all the sacrifices, all the washing of the pots and washing of the pans and washing of the bowls and cleansing of the cups and all you know everything where it was laid out and how it was done and why it was done and who was allowed to go where and all that only pointed to the fact that he wants us to be pure and holy that that, that was all the elaborate detail of what you'd have to do to try to satisfy God and yet fail because none of them could keep it perfectly and I'm sure a lot of them tried, but no one did. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The ceremonial law is not relevant because it's been completed in Christ, in his cross, in his life, in his resurrection. It's an outward witness of something that's supposed to take part on the inside, like baptism. It is a witness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and of that death, burial, and resurrection in us at the new birth. It, it is an outward witness. It, it's a sign to the world that there's something different going on here. Like communion is an outward witness that the body and blood of Jesus Christ has made us different. You know, the Catholic Church teaches that that actually becomes his body and his blood. The, the Word of God says that, as we just read in Hebrews 9, now, once, he was crucified. You know, we, we don't re-crucify him every Sunday taking communion communion. He said, do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. They think their salvation hinges on taking that communion. It's just a sign. 
it's an outward ceremonial sign of the body that was killed for us and the blood that was shed for us. If it literally became the body and blood, we are forbidden from eating human beings and from partaking of blood in, in the Old Testament. God would be literally contradicting his own word and we would be cannibals. It's a stupid teaching. It's not true. It's an outward witness to something else, like all the ceremonies in the Old Testament. People want to conflate when they start arguing with you about the Bible. You know, if you say something against homosexuality, well, you know, if that's wrong, then you better not eat shrimp. Because it says not to eat shrimp, then you, you better not sit there and sow two different kinds of seeds together in the soil, or you better not put two different kinds of cloth together, you know, because they don't have any idea what they're talking about. He didn't want things to be mixed because he wanted things to be pure the way he created them. He, he wants us to be pure the way we were originally created. But people conflate the death penalty with eating shrimp, with trespassing on someone's property, with judging others. There's all different things going on here. They want to jumble together to try to make the moral views of the Bible look ridiculous when they don't understand that there's a civil aspect and a ceremonial aspect to the laws in the Bible that the ceremonial doesn't apply at all anymore. And the civil applies to what civilization you're in. But the moral trumps all of them. The moral is what we need to follow. When God says something's a sin, it's a sin. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. It doesn't matter that our culture accepts abortion. It's still murder. It doesn't matter that our culture accepts homosexuality. It's still a sin in God's word has nothing to do with ceremony or civil rights. Our civil rights are determined by our civilization. But God says it's wrong. And it's right for us to try to overturn those things because we're standing for God's word and what God says we should be doing. They'll conflate murder with capital punishment because I say, well, the word, the, the Bible says, you know, you're not supposed to kill, so you can't kill that person. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill, but that word kill is the word murder, if it was translated properly. It literally says, if man murders a man, by man he shall be killed. They're two different words. Capital punishment is taught in the Bible as a penalty for killing someone, for murdering someone. They conflate freedom from sin with freedom to sin. It's like Paul said, it, it, because I've been set free from sin, and that was a good and gracious thing, and mercy was poured out on me because of that, and enable that to happen, should I then sin so that grace can, you know, do more and more great works in me? He said, God forbid. You know, we're free from sin. <laughs> you know, don't take it as a liberty to sin. Take it as a liberty to not sin. We will look at all of this in the coming weeks with more detail. This is an introduction, an overview. We'll look at each group that I mentioned in the next coming weeks. I want to bring up a few more things and we'll be done with today. Introduction to the God of Law in order in Romans 13, 1 through 7.
civilization falls, there is no civil anymore. What would you do? What, what would be your response to that? You know, such a thing happened in Jeremiah chapter 52. Their civilization fell. They were invaded by the Babylonians. And we're going to read that here. But I want you to ask yourself that. If, you know, if we were invaded by a foreign power and our civilization fell, or if all the chaos in our country finally crumbles everything, we have an economic meltdown, we have a societal meltdown, and there's no law and order going on whatsoever, and everything's anarchy, like some anarchist think they want to have happen. What would you do? Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 12 through 24. It says, Now in the fifth month and the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon, to Jerusalem, and burned the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men, he burned with fire. Your church just got burnt down. They just burnt down the White House. And all the rich people's houses have been burnt. The socialists have taken over. And they decided to get rid of the White House, all the places of worship, and attack all the rich people. Kind of sounds like today's newspaper, doesn't it? It's all the rich people's fault. And all the army of the Chaldeans that were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls of Jerusalem round about. All the protection's gone. You know, there's no border. They had walls to act as borders. A society without walls, like the socialists want. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive certain of the poor of the people and the residue of the people that remained in the city and those that fell away and fell to the king of Babylon and the rest of the multitude. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left certain of the poor of the land for vine dressers and for husbandmen, for farmers and such like that. Also the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord, and the bases, and the brazen sea that was in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke and carried all the brass of them to Babylon. The cauldrons also, and the shovels, and the snuffers, and the bowls, and the spoons, and all the vessels of brass, wherewith they ministered, they took away and the basins, and fire pans, and the bowls, and the cauldrons, and the candlesticks, and the spoons, and the cups, that which was of gold in gold, and that which was of silver in silver, took the captain of the guard away. The two pillars, one sea, and twelve brazen bowls that were under the bases, which King Solomon had made in the house of the Lord, the brass of all these vessels was unmeasurable there was so much of it it was all taken away all of them and a chapter I'm sorry and concerning the pillars the height of one pillar was 18 cubits that's about 27 feet and a fillet of twelve cubits did compass it, and the thickness thereof was four fingers, it was hollow, and a chapter of brass was upon it, and the height of one chapter was five cubits, 
with net work and pomegranates upon the chapters round about all of brass. The second pillar also and the pomegranates were like unto these. And there were ninety-six pomegranates on a side, and all the pomegranates upon the network were a hundred round about. And the captain of the guard took Sarai, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the door. There's no place of worship left. There's no walls of protection. And they took away all the things they used during worship and the officiants. They took away their ministers. They took away the deacons. They took away the greeters. They took away the choir. They took away everything. And I asked a few minutes ago, what would you do? If your relationship with God is dependent upon a building on a corner or with the people inside that building or with the choir books or offering plates or the baptismal font or whatever it is, the pews, whatever you want to make it, the communion plates. If that is how you reach God through those things, then they just took God from you. What would you do? That should not be how you reach God. God should be a part of your life. Not just for an hour on Sunday. Not just when they offer communion. Not just when somebody stands up and talks to you. Not just when the choir sings. That should be like the icing on the cake. It shouldn't be the cake. What would you do? I suggest to get an upgrade. We already read Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant that I want to make with them. I will write my laws in their inward parts, and I will engrave them upon their heart. You know, you're not going to sit there and look at two pillars that say, I'm not allowed to do that, and I'm not allowed to do that. I did that, and I shouldn't do that again. That's not what he wanted. He gave that to them like you would give a child instructions. But as you become more mature in your religious life, as it were, you shouldn't need a list of things you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. It should be a natural outpouring from in you. What would you do if they took away your church building? 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? We are the worship place, not that building. That building is a, an assemblage. It's a place where you go to gather together to do what you can do already yourself within yourself. It's a place to pray to God. It's a place to worship God. It's a place to learn about God. It's a place to tell God how much you love him and to experience his love. We are that place. What would you do if they took away your worship place? Get an upgrade. Be the worship place. John 10, 29. What would you do if they took away all the walls of protection? What would you do if society completely breaks down? Get an upgrade. John 10, 29. John 10, 28. 
through 30. Jesus said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. He said, I've got you. The Father's got you. We've got you. You can't take away that protection. They might chop your head off. They might hang you from the highest tree. They might electrocute you. They might shoot you in the head. They might do any of those things to you, and you're still completely protected because this is just a carcass. Your spirit is completely protected. No matter what walls they tear down, no matter what building they get rid of. What about if you lost all the people? Like happened in Jeremiah 52. They took away their priest. They took away the guys that kept the door. They took away all the officials. They took away all the people that were running the house of worship. What would you do? John 14. John 14, 16 and 17 and verse 23. Jesus said in verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Then he said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and shall be in you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. The Holy Spirit and the Father and Son. Do you need a minister? Do you need a priest? Do, do you need the, the, the door people or the choir? If you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as your officiants in your house of worship. They're a nice addition. Just like icing's a nice addition. I love chocolate cake. As you can tell, I love chocolate cake. It's good by itself. It just adds a little something to it to put icing on top of it. You know, all those things are icing. The cake is the Father. The Son, the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we have our temple. We have our protection. And we have all the efficients in our house of worship that we need. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Get an upgrade. If your Christianity depends on a building or on someone talking to you, or upon listening to some other people sing to you, or whatever it is, that that's just the icing. It should not be the whole thing. I want to quickly, if I can, look at Daniel 3. I know this is the longest introduction in the history of the world but we're looking at the God of law and order these things are important to understand what we're talking about the the things in the Old Testament the Old Covenant pointed to the New Covenant and they didn't go away they became something far more intriguing, far more involved. They went from physical, rote 
written down things to observe to something spiritual that encompasses your mind, your heart, your very inner being, that it changes you from the inside out. The God of law and order sets up law and order in his word, in his kingdom, in the coming kingdom. Even though we disagree with large things that take place in our society, it still has structure. It has a government. As dysfunctional as it is, if it didn't have one, we would all be in a, quite a mess. You know, nationally, a state government, a city government. If we didn't have a police force, can you imagine? You know, the lights go out in some major city, they have a blackout, and all the stores get raided. They get their windows broke out, stuff is stolen. Our very civilization would collapse within a week if something catastrophic happened. Because the moral is lacking. The moral law is lacking in our people. The only reason there's any civil law being followed by most of the people is because they're afraid of getting in trouble. Daniel chapter 3. When civilization tries to overrule God, like now, what will you do? I ask you up in Jeremiah 52, what would you do? I'm going to ask you now, what will you do? What are you doing? Because it's already happening. Abortion's murder, but it's completely okay in our country. And it used to be that a woman would only have an abortion in the first few months. Now they can have an abortion at nine months in some cases. In Virginia and New York, they've discussed if, you know, if the mother changes her mind after the child's born, that it's, you know, perfectly okay to go ahead and dispose of that child. I said this before, but the Romans would allow you to kill your child up till the age of 18. You know, it depends on what your civilization believes, what they think is wrong. God, who is the ultimate authority on what's right or wrong, because he invented what's right and what's wrong, says it's murder. From conception, it's a murder. On day one, it's a murder. Forget the first trimester or second or third or, or post-birth abortion. Forget all that. Day one. When civilization tries to overrule God, what will you do? Daniel chapter 3. I was going to read all this. I think I'm going to go through and hit some highlights. Nebuchadnezzar, the king... In verse 1, made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits. That would be 90 feet. And 6 cubits across. 90 feet high, 9 feet across. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, and the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. The princes the governors and captains and judges and treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar 
the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of music, all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whosoever will not fall down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of himself that the people were to fall down and worship at a moment's notice. He was placing himself in the place of God. When civilization tries to overthrow God, when civilization thinks that they are God, when the government thinks that they're the authority on everything about you and everything about everything, and they try to put themselves in the place of Almighty God, this is what happens. What will you do? You can either fall down and worship their false god or die. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, down in verse 16, we're going to see, had that choice to make. They were told on by others that they weren't falling down and worshiping this false god, this image of a man. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. What it literally says is, is we have no need to answer you about this. He was saying, you know, I don't even need to talk to you. You're just a man. That's the implication of the text. That was disrespectful unless you consider he's trying to put himself in the position of God, and then it's time to call it like it is. You should give to everyone their due, honor to whom honor, taxes to whom taxes, as we'll see in Romans 13, 7. Whatever their due is, you give them. If this man was respectful, if this man did not try to go beyond his authority, they had been living in this kingdom without a problem. But now he's drawn a line in the sand. Now he's put himself over God. And he says, they say to him, you know, we don't even have to answer you, but I'll tell you what. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able, more than able, quite able, extraordinarily able, to smack you in the mouth, O king. No, he didn't say that. He said to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Our God's able. In verse 18, he says, but if not, if, he's, if he chooses not to, if he decides to let us go ahead and die, that's okay too. He says, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. That didn't go over well with the king at all. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed. He was furious against Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, 
Therefore he spoke and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. And they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there, tied up, so they couldn't try to run out. So they had no chance to get away. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king, in verse 24, was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did we not throw three men into the midst of the fire. And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king, because Nebuchadnezzar's got a problem now. He's like, I, there's too many people in there. We threw three in there, right, fellas? He answered and said, Look, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Yes, it was. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come here. Things changed because they stood up for God. Things changed because God stood up for them. Nebuchadnezzar makes a new decree. If they would have gone along with the program and said, you know what, it's okay to do that. You know, that's a, it's you know that's just an image that's. You know, like, an image that could be God for all we know. You know, it's okay to do that. You know, I'm proud of all you guys for doing that. Yeah, that's good. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, people do in society today, it's okay to be a homosexual. It's okay. I support you in your decision to become a, a girl, boy, girl, half human, half not human, whatever, you know, five trillion different things they think they are. It's okay. Then this wouldn't have happened. And nothing would have changed. But if the people of God will stand up and open their mouth and keep saying it's a sin, it's wrong. God didn't ordain it that way. This is all God's deal. It's not yours. If the people of God will stand up and say what God says. Things can change. Verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar makes a new decree. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language would speak anything against the God, excuse me, the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver like this. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They went from being on the outs to being promoted to high honor because. They followed what God said to do. Will you worship their God and be rewarded appropriately by being sent to God's version of the fiery furnace, which we call hell? Or will you follow God and allow them to do what they do? We follow their thoughts, 
laws and values or be an outcast. Will you speak their truth or be called a liar, a hater, a racist, blah, blah, blah by the people that are liars and haters and racists? They got delivered because they stood up for what they knew was right. Very quickly, when we go down through these things, we're going to look at, we just looked at a little preview of moral and civil and ceremonial law. Order in church is God, the minister, the deacons, the congregation. We'll get into this more. God died for us. Jesus became a servant for all of us. The minister, Jesus said, you that will be great among you, let him be a servant of all. The deacons wait on people in the church. They seat them. They serve them communion. And then you have the congregation. That's order in church. Order in the family is God, husband, wife, children. And we'll get more into this. God talks about the wife being the weaker vessel. A lot of women would take that as an insult. If you think about that as being a fragile, expensive, delicate vase that you want to wrap in bubble wrap, and make sure that the movers don't destroy because it's such a treasure. Your, your thought pattern might be a little different, being called the weaker vessel. If you've got some old metal jug that you you know you can't hurt and you just throw it in the back of the truck, you know that would be the husband. You know he he's trying to teach the fellows something, trying to teach the wives to listen to what their husband had to say and try and teach the fellows to keep their dumb hands to themselves. She's a fragile vessel. She's weaker than you. She's more precious than you. It's set up this way for order to eliminate arguments. It is for the man to love and care for and protect his wife like an expensive heirloom. In society, when these things break down, we have disorder. It leads to riots, disrespect of others, their property, their rights, police being attacked, and crime going running amok. And government disorder leads to calling for the murder of babies. It leads to calling for no death penalty for murderers. It leads to legalizing drugs and backing sinful things like homosexuality and transgenderism. And the family disorder leads to high divorce rates, kids in therapy, and everybody using alcohol and drugs. Disorder in the church leads to having women pastors, leads to having homosexuals as church members, leads to having lesbian ministers and homosexual ministers and transgender bishops and all these abominable, disgusting, stupid things that have no place in the house of God. It leads to churches splitting. It leads to no witness to a lost world. The church says anything goes, then anything goes. The world already feels that way. When the church endorses it, the game's over. That was the introduction to what we're going to be speaking about in the next several weeks as we look at the law. We look at the God of law and order, and we see why he set these things up and why they're important to follow God's instructions to the letter because he's the one that knows how we're made. He's the one that knows how everything is supposed to work. So it only makes sense to follow his directions. 
if you get some toy for your child at Christmas and it's got 200 parts and you decide to freelance it and not follow the directions, you're going to end up with 53 parts laying left on your floor and the thing isn't going to work right. And that's what people do when they ignore God and His instructions. Would you bow with me for a closing prayer, please? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for law and order in our universe and in our world as you've created. We pray as you told us to, your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray that someday soon all this will be wiped away and law and order will be the order of the day. I ask you just now, if there's any of you out there that have not ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would follow me in this prayer and receive him now. And say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you for shedding your blood for me. I thank you that your death was the one-time perfect sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. I receive that gift just now. I receive that sacrifice. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. And I thank you for it. I turn from my sins. I repent. I, wa I want to leave my sins behind. I want to be filled with you. I, I want to have you as the Lord of my life, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We uh, have a lot to look at the next few weeks. I, I hope that you'll join us. I hope that you will ask others to watch so that uh, we can reach more people. God bless you. We'll see you next week. You have a great week.